about if you have experienced the grace of God, the love of God. Could I hear you say amen? Amen. amen. God's good. Right. David said, come magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name out. Together. Together. That's what we're doing. We're magnifying the Lord. That's what great are you, Lord. Great is the terminology of magnifying. That's great. That's making it big. And we're doing it. We're doing it together. And what we're doing is we're pointing our hearts, pointing our hearts towards the beauty of God. Has the ability to change. These moments like this have have greater ability to change than any of our our own self-willpower has. A.W. Tozer says, sometimes I go to God and say, God, if thou will... Thou dost never answer another prayer while I live on this earth. I will still worship you because as long as I live and in the ages to come, because of what you have already done, God's already put me so far in debt that if I were to live one million millenniums, I couldn't pay him for what he's done for me. Yeah. Yeah, what a perspective. God is good. All right, won't you be seated? Glad you're here. If you're visiting for the first time, welcome. I hope up until this point you have, uh, you have felt welcome. We are a community of people who is trying to follow Jesus as closely as we can. Not perfect, right? Yeah, you're shaking your head. You're going like, yeah, I'm not perfect. We're not perfect, but we do believe the words of Jesus. We believe what he said about himself. He said he is the way, the truth, and the life. And because we believe that, then we, we believe that he has uh, the answers for life. We believe that he, he gives reality. So you will find every Sunday that we, we will come together and we will, we will uh, talk about Scripture. We'll talk about the Word of God, the, the Bible. Uh, Second Corinthians, not Second Corinthians, Second uh, Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed, breathed out by God, and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, so that... He said, we study scripture so that you would be prepared for every good, for every good work. So during this part of the service, we always like to turn our attention towards uh, what the Bible has to say and pray that it will be planted in our hearts. Amen? Amen. Uh, we have, uh, we've been looking at for the past, I think it's been about eight weeks, might be nine weeks, eight or nine weeks, a letter that's in, in the very end of the New Testament, and it's written by Jesus' little brother, and it's called the letter of James. James was Jesus' little brother. Wouldn't that be cool to have Jesus as your older brother? Like, if you were getting bullied or something, you know, just, just tell Jesus. Let Jesus take care of it. But we've been looking at what he, he has had to say in his letter, and we have made our way to chapter 3. So if you have, I know a lot of you guys have your James journals. If you have James journals, you can take that out. If not, you can you know, pull up an app on your phone or, or just listen uh, it should be on the screen for us. Here we go. Chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach, you see James using we here, he's including himself. We who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. So if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle, to control his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we, we guide, we guide, we direct, we steer their entire bodies. So you see what James is saying, it's just a little bitty thing can steer a very big thing. Then he goes on with another metaphor. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue, it's a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile, sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. Or he's saying, with it, we come in on Sundays and we sing worship songs. 
And with it, we curse people who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So what we have learned up until this time is that James is a very practical book. It's, it's been referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's saying that if, if, if you have been affected by the gospel, then this is how you should practically live your life. And, and individually, but also as a community, he's talking to the church. If you have accepted the grace of God, if, if you have um, been affected by who he is, then as a community of faith, this is how you should practically live. And he takes this passage that we're on and he talks about the power of the tongue. That if you have been, if, if you've received the grace of God, if you, the gospel has affected your life, then this is how your tongue, your words, your speech should be influenced. And it's like James is being a doctor here in that, in that he's saying, you know, stick out your tongue. You know, you go to the doctor and the doctor say, hey, you know, stick out your tongue for me. Let me look at your tongue. And James is saying, I want to look at your tongue. Let's, in this passage, let's look at your tongue. Or let's look at what words are on your tongue. Because words... Your speech are symptoms. They're symptoms. They're symptoms of what? Well, what comes out of the mouth comes from somewhere. You say something, you say, oh, I didn't mean to say that. That's not me. No, that's you. It came from somewhere. And, and, and we say, oh, no, it's a terrible, this is a terrible thought to look at my words and my speech. So it's going to reveal me. It's going to expose me. Listen, that's a good thing. And this is a safe place to do that, to say, guys, uh, let, let's look at my tongue. Let's look at my speech. Let's look what, what I'm saying so that, so that you, can, you can do a work inside of me. So he begins in verse 1. He says, not many of you should be teachers because teachers will be judged with greater strictness. And in this, we have to add commentary because we say, what does James mean here? And commentators will say he can mean two different things. One is that teachers, if you're a teacher or if you have um, a a presence in front of a lot of people and you're giving instruction, then you become an example. So there's a greater, there's a greater accountability for you. So you're teaching, there's greater accountability. And other people will say, well, teachers, they, they say a lot of words. So if you say a lot of words, you got to be very, very careful to represent well. As in Proverbs 10, 19, it says, when words are many, sin is not absent. When you talk a lot, there's a lot of chances for sin to be there. Or, as Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Yeah, oh snap. I didn't know that was in there. Yeah, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless or idle word they speak. So he says, not many should become teachers. In verse 2, he says, but we all stumble in many ways. But if anyone doesn't stumble, well, why, James? Here's what James says. It's almost unbelievable. It's almost hard for me to believe this. He says, we stumble in many ways, but if anyone doesn't stumble, it's because, what? He can control his tongue. He can bridle his tongue. We're like, James, I, I don't know. why. I mean, how can you say that? He is saying that controlling your tongue, by controlling your tongue, you can control your entire, your entire body body being synonymous with your entire life. Control your mouth, control your tongue, control your words, control your entire body. And he goes into three metaphors to describe this. He says, verse 3, if we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide, we direct, we steer their whole bodies as well. Then he says, look at ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. You see, he's saying there is a pilot, and the pilot can direct this huge piece of equipment by something that's really, really small, a rudder. Wherever the pilot, wherever you want yourself, your life to go, you can direct your life, he's saying, by your words, by your speech. Is he saying there's a pilot, 
It's directing this huge ship, even with bad things, storms, winds on the outside of it. He's directing it by the very words that he's speaking. And then he says, so also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. He goes back to a metaphor, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. So I say with these three metaphors, incredible teacher, incredible way. What's James trying to nail down here? What is James trying to teach us to, to bring home, to get the coin to drop for us about these three metaphors using this? Is that small things, small things can have a very big impact. That's why he goes and he talks about a rudder. A rudder, I don't know a whole lot about rudders other than what, I, what I've read, is that it's at the end of a, a boat, end of a ship, and it directs, it steers the ship. A very small thing directing, I think a rudder could weigh up to 60 pounds, directing a ship or a boat that could weigh over 2,000 pounds. That's what James is using. Then, then he talks about a bit. He says, put in, the, in, in a, the mouth of a horse. So this, uh, man, it probably weighs three pounds max. Just like, put it in the mouth of a horse, and you can direct a, a beast that weighs 2,000 pounds. James is being a really good teacher here. He's trying to show you how very small things can have a huge effect, a big effect. So put this in, a, in the mouth of a horse, and you can direct that horse wherever, wherever you want it to go. And then he talks about a match. He gets even smaller. He said, how many, how many fires have been started just by one single spark? And we talk California wildfires, millions of dollars were uh, of damage, lives lost. Why? Because somebody was playing with a match. One spark, one cigarette butt thrown down, something, but something so small can cause huge amounts of damage. And right now, you're probably already saying, just like I am, I'm tracking with you. I'm tracking with you. You don't even have to go any further because there have been words spoken to me before that's had so, that, that I'm still dealing with. You know, you know, you know the saying, sticks, sticks and stones may break my bones. Words may never hurt me. It's a childhood saying. Kind of an irony is, is that adults go back to those childhood sayings and, and struggle with it and wrestle with words that's been spoken over there by their parents, people who love them so much. Then he talks about the tongue. And, and just, for, just for grins, <clears throat> might not be grins, might be gags. Um, wonder what's in the bag, huh? But he talks about the tongue. You know it's not good if you have to put a glove on it. This is going to make some of y'all very hungry and some of y'all very gaggy. You know who you are, so. Uh, but uh, I searched Beaumont, man. Beaumont's not. This is, this is a tongue, right? That's a tongue. Yeah, that's a, that is a tongue. That thing costs $22, by the way. <laughs> And I went to a lot of stores and finally found this thing. And I'm not going to pull it all out because it's a little drippy. <clears throat> this is what James is talking about. You want to pet it? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I'm never coming back here again. Uh, this is a tongue. That, that's just like. But it can direct. It can steer. I just wanted this to, to stick out in your mind that we're talking about the tongue. And, and by the way, if you, if you want this after service, uh, you're welcome. If this is your thing and you like to cook it and you want to eat it, I know I've got a, a relative that said, that is delicious. I was like, oh, I'm not going to find out. But James is wanting us to know that very small things, <laughs> very small things can make a, 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 a big, big difference. In fact, we, he would be saying like this, the tongue has creative abilities. Words have creative abilities. When you think about Genesis 1-1, how the world was made. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, he, he what? He said, let there be light. Let there be light. Now, we're not God. And, and it would really be cool if we could speak something and create physical properties. But God created everything, nothing, something from nothing by speaking words. And we, we don't have the ability to create certain things like that. But what we do know is that how is self-esteem formed? 
How, how has self-esteem been torn down in the past? How has your self-esteem been built up before? By, by people speaking kind words. I see in you type conversations. This is what I see in you. You have incredible amounts of, or, or, or you're a loser, or you never do anything like your brother or your sister, or you always, or whatever. These words have creative powers over us. They, you, you tell a kid you're stupid enough and, and you're close enough to that kid, it goes deep. It penetrates into that, that child like a chemical going down into the ground. It penetrates deeply into that. And we know that because a lot of people in this room, you still deal with, with hearing words that were spoken to you 20, 30, maybe even 40 years ago. What about marriages? Words have destroyed. Words have made marriages. Words that you wish you, you wouldn't have said, words that, that you have said, words that have been spoken over you. Um, it, it's like a sword. You, you, put a, you can put a sword in and you, you put it in someone's flesh and pull that sword out and you could say, oh, I'm so sorry I just did that. But the sword's not there, but the wound is. And Proverbs 18, 21 says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. And look, I, I've heard... I, I've heard that scripture enough that it almost, I almost just pass it over. But it says life, and just think how, how extreme this statement is. That life and death are in the power of your tongue. That every father in here, you have the ability to speak life or death over your children. Every wife, every husband, every mom... You have the ability, we have the ability, we have something in our, our disposal, our arsenal, to be able to speak either life or to speak death over the people that we love. Verbal communication words, they're wonderful to have, right? They help us express our thoughts. They help us express affections that we have. I mean, if you wouldn't be able to have words or, or communication, you would have all these feelings and things that you would like to try to convey, but you can't. So words aren't terrible things. They're, they're good or bad, life or death. They're wonderful to have, to be able to, to get across what we're feeling. But they're penetrating because words have the ability to cre create realities for people. Like gossip. Gossip creates realities for other people that, that aren't true. That other people may believe about them and be, begins to see a nuance about them. Or, or maybe if, if, if you, you or you know someone that they did just complain all the time. It's a terrible day. I, I hate my life. Eventually, those words create a type of life, a pessimistic life. Or maybe you're very angry at somebody. And you, you go off with a friend and you begin to talk about the emotions and the thoughts and the feelings that you have about another person. And as you talk about it, you get angrier and angrier and angrier because what the words are doing, they're putting realities to the thoughts and the ideas that we have. They're, they're clothing, clothing the things that are in our minds. And sometimes the thoughts that we have we're not aware of, but the moment it comes out of our mouth, we're like, oh my goodness, is that, is that in there? And when these neg thing, negative things are spoken against you or against me, we as humans have a tendency to cling to all the negative that's spoken about us. And so do your children, and so does your spouse, and so do the people that you work with. Because I could go, I could go today and I could have nine things good told about me. You did a great job, or I love this about you. And one person could come up with a criticism. And tonight I'll go to bed thinking about the one thing because we have a tendency as, 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 uh, as humans to just cling around the negative. It's like, it's like Google reviews. If you own a business, and I'm sure you've checked your Google reviews to see what other people and customers are saying about you. Last I checked, Praise Church has 93 Google reviews. And out of five stars, we have 4.6. And I think anybody owning a business would say, well, that's, that's pretty good. We've got a little bit of room of improvement there. But overall, you know, that's, that's pretty good. And I would, there, there was times that I would go through those Google reviews and just read and see what people were saying about Praise Church. And then I ran across one that just, like, destroyed us. I'm going, like, what? It's, like, terrible. Had, came in, didn't feel welcome. They felt 
ter terrible, you know, that felt like they were isolated. And then they come into the church, and here, here's the one thing that stuck out to me. Out of all this good, like 93 reviews, and you've got this one here that sticks out so much. It's one thing that says, and the pastor, the pastor uh, doesn't even read from the Bible. I'm going, What? We're reading through James, right? We're reading verse by verse, but I don't know why. And so what am I doing? You know, what are you doing when you hear all these good things and this bad thing? You're thinking about all oh, hey, this bad thing that's been said about you. Because we, as human nature, we, we just, I don't know what it is. We gravitate and we don't like to, you know, don't like to, to think that about ourselves. James says in verse 8, the last part of it, he says this about the tongue. It's a restless evil. This is penetrating. It's full of deadly poison. Like your tongue, my tongue, my words, what I say could be medicine or it could be poison. Poison in, in either way, it like can sink really deep down to places that, that actions, it, just, just, it can sink, sink very, very far down. So you say, well, what kind of words are full of poison? We'll say, well, Let's just, let's bullet point some of them. What about put downs? Unnecessary criticisms. Or gossip. Boasting. Boasting could be poison. Um, lies. Spinning the truth. These are, these are poison. These, these are lies. And there's lies that, that not only levied at other people, but it's the words that we levy at ourselves. Right? Why can't you just get it straight, Reggie? We talk, we have this internal dialogue. You're maybe, I don't know if you say this, I, you're a loser. You're, you can't do anything right, or you're not as good as somebody else, or you remind yourself that you, you quit something. So these words, these words that come out of our mouth aren't, only poison for other people, but they become poison for you. You're poisoning your own life. And what, what, what Scripture says is they are lies because you may have failed at something, but God doesn't see you as a failure. So if you tell yourself that you're a failure, then you're contradicting the view that God has of you. Therefore, in God's view, you're lying to yourself about yourself. But yet use words as you begin to speak them and put these thoughts into to, to intelligible things that you can hear become your reality. And it begins to shape and direct and steer your life. And what he's saying is, no, no, no. You, you've got the ability also to speak life over yourself. I mean, words have power, but they don't just have destructive power. If they have destructive power, that means they also have constructive power. He said, not only death's in, your, in the power of the tongue, but life is in the power of the tongue. That wherever you go and whoever you see, that if you were aware enough and in touch enough, you could speak life to them. Life to people who may be like dying. Like emotionally dying or feeling like they're not worth anything. Wherever you go, you have the ability to speak. You give, give medicine, not poison. Let me give you these scriptures. If you're taking notes, write these down. Proverbs 8, 16, 1624. Proverbs 1624. Solomon says this about words. Gracious words are like a honeycomb. They're sweet to the soul. And health to the body. Gracious words. Your gracious words are like a honeycomb. Give life. Proverbs 12, 18. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. I've, I've, I've had a few sword thrusts. I've, I've given some blows. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 15 and 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A soft answer. You want to de-escalate a problem, de-escalate a situation? You want to help somebody else that's very angry? Soft answer. A soft answer. And turn away wrath. But a harsh word 
You're just going to stir up, stir up anger. And so these, these are some scriptures that tell us you've got, you've got power. You've got power to destroy or you have power to, to build with your tongue. In fact, from the rest of our lives, we ought to use a certain scripture, Ephesians 4.29, as a, as a filter and a formula for how to speak, how, how, how we ought to use our, our words. It goes like this. Paul writes it. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, if you're looking at that scripture, especially in that journal, you see there's, there's commas, and I think where the commas are, it breaks it up appropriately because there's four parts, four parts to the scripture that if we would begin to, to live out today would, would make a huge difference, make a difference in the people that you're around just through your words. First, here's what he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Let no corrupting talk, let no poison come out of your mouth. Now, in other translations, it says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Let no unwholesome talk. Now, if you look up the word unwholesome in the Greek, it means stinky, putrid, rotten. So that's Paul. Paul is saying, let, let no unwholesome, let no stinky, putrid, decaying words ever come out of your mouth. Now, the other day, we, um, we, we noticed in our kitchen that... It had some fruit flies. Anybody ever get fruit flies in, in your kitchen? It's like those little gnats. They like reproduce like crazy. Before long, it's got like a swarm in your house. It's like we got to do something about this. So we have this credenza, and we have our fruit tray on top of it. And one side of the fruit tray is apples, oranges, and then we hang bananas on it. So it's just a wonderful place to grow a, a gnat nest. And um, <clears throat> they're all over the place. So my family's like, we got to do something about this. So they, they're, they're cleaning up, and they pull the credenza out. And they notice that behind the credenza, there's the source of all the gnats. It's a banana that looks like it's been there for 20 years. So the banana is no longer yellow. It's black. And it's very, very soft. And it's, it's like a liquid. You could put a, saw, a straw in and you know, have your own smoothie right there. So there it is. And I'm like, you know, they're looking at it. And they're, they're like, how are we going to clean this thing up? And I'm like, I got it. I got this because I got this new toy. It's my favorite. Or it's not a new toy, but my favorite appliance ever. It's called the shop vac. I love the shop vac. I love sucking things up. It just makes you feel so productive. Like immediately, like there's a leaf. There's not the leaf anymore. It's like I just did something. And so I go get my little, it's a two-gallon shop vac. It's got two horsepower. It will It'll sock a suck up, a uh, sock up into it, and so I, I'm like trying to get the gnats right. I'm like catching gnats with the with the shop vac, and then down below it's got some juice, and I'm just getting the juice up too, and I get too close to the banana. Yeah, it's like whew, the whole banana like sucked up, sucked up into the shop vac, and so I just keep doing it. Well, you know what's happening in the exhaust. Man, I am filling the house with the nastiest smell you've ever smelled. And Shannon's over there, that's my wife, she's all going, please <laughs> cut it up, cut it off because I have, I have sucked this banana up now in my shop back and it's exhausting its putrid, smelly fumes. And what James, what, what Paul here would be saying is that when we are talking, an unwholesome talk, we are filling the air with a putrid smell. Right? Every one of us, we've, we've been guilty of that. So here, here's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you something to be accountable for, right? And, and I'm going to put a little pastoral pressure on today. A little pastoral pressure. Hold you accountable. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. So one day challenge. I'll, it won't kill anybody. One day challenge. No unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Now, a challenge isn't good unless you have an accountability partner. You've got to have an accountability partner. You know right now who your accountability partner is. If they're in the room, catch eyes, because you're going to talk tomorrow about this. You've got to hold each other accountable. I'm going to ask my wife to hold me accountable tomorrow. So you, you text somebody today and say, hey, will you hold me accountable? Text somebody in church. You've got to talk about it tomorrow. But no unwholesome talk. No lies, no gossip, no criticisms, no talk downs, no talk down to yourself. Um, anything that would be considered like stinky talk, no unwholesome talk coming out of your mouth. Now, that's, that, that's step one. Step two, though, is what Paul talks about. But only such as good for building people up. 
So first, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, only that which is good for building people up. Now building, if you look in other translations, it says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, only that which is edifying. Edifying. Anybody heard the word edifying? Like edifying means build up because edifying comes from the word that means edifice. And the edifice is a building. So he says only words that would help build up, that would, that would construct, not tear down, but construct. So only words that you would speak over someone's life that would make their life a place for the Holy Spirit to reside. How about that? So if you're building a building and you're building a building for the Holy Spirit, you're going to want to build the best building that you can because the Holy Spirit deserves that. And so when I'm helping build other people up, I want to speak words that is appropriate for the Holy Spirit to live in because we are temples of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So what we want to do is use our tongue to build in other people a place for the Holy Spirit to reside. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, only such as good as building up as fits the occasion. That's number three. As fits the occasion. But what does that mean? It means you need to know what's going on in the other person's life so that you can speak specifically to their needs. Right? Someone going through depression? Then speak to the occasion. Like, like sometimes we have this, this tendency or, or or go, hey, that's awesome, you're great, you're incredible. But those are very abstract words. What about if you could come down and know exactly what's going on in the person's life so that you could speak as fits the occasion, right? Because if you could be aware of what's going on in the moment of that person, then you could take your words and build, construct, according to what that person needs right now. And the fourth part is, so, this is so cool, that it may give grace to those who hear. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Only such is good for building up, as fits the occasion, and here's the result, that it may give grace to those who hear. And here's what, what that means. So that your words would be a blessing. Your words would be a delight. Your words would be a joy to the people that you hear. That you, that you would be a blessing. That you would give grace. He's like, I don't know. I don't know that I could, I could give grace. How, wouldn't you love to know? We, we have a, you know, our, our vision statement. Love God, love people, and you know you could just make a difference by the words that you speak tomorrow. Do you know there are words that I could tell you right now that my father spoke over me, that coaches have spoke over me, that teachers have spoke over me 40 years ago that I still remember? And do you know that tomorrow you can speak words over people that they will, live, they will remember for the rest of their life that will build them up? You say, I don't know that I could do it. Yeah, you can. You can. Because you've been given grace. And you can give that same grace. You have overflow. You have overflow. You have something to give. You remember when Jesus was on the cross, like right before it was over, he spoke seven statements using words in those statements. And some of those were, um, it is finished. And uh, behold your mother. I'm thirsty. But there was one statement that he said, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's like God went silent, like solitary confinement for Jesus in the sense of not hearing from God. No words from God, no words. And that was part of the plan for Jesus to have to carry and shoulder the weight of the world, that there would be separation, no communication, no words from, from his source. He says, my God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? You see, you, you see what, what's happening? That there were no words spoken over Jesus so that you could get God's affirmative word spoken over you. That Jesus got the silent treatment so that you can hear God say, you're my son, you're my daughter, you're adopted, you're loved, I want you. And so you have 
plenty of grace inside of you that you have already received. Grace, as Paul says, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So you will always have a, 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 a huge pile of grace that you can always give to other people. And you can use it. And you can give that pile. It's like, how in the world can I give that pile? You can do it a lot of ways, right? Random acts of kindness. You could, you could do it just by your words. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. None. No more. Only that which is building up as fits the occasion so that it may give grace to those who have listened. I think it would be incredible that every person that you come in contact with left feeling like they have been built up and not torn down. And they can. They can. Because you have the ability. Let me give you one more scripture. Write this down. This is a great scripture to memorize. Psalms 141 and 3 says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. What a good prayer, huh? Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I want you, I want you to stand because I want us to pray as you're, as you're standing. You know, stay in a, a reverent mood and we're going to go into one song of worship. Can we just go like ask God for his help in our words? Yeah? Anybody else besides me needs help controlling his tongue? I, I, I want to be speaking life. I want to be speaking hope. I want to speak encouragement. Not just here on stage, just on the public forum. I'm just talking about in, in private. I want, I want to go, you know, my family for sure. I want my kids. I want to, to build up my kids. I want to build up my, my wife. I want to build up my family. I want to build up people in public as well. If I go out in public and someone's having a terrible day, I want to have enough guts to say, you know what, I've been given a lot of grace here. Here's a, here's a bad situation. God, speak through me. And he says you can. Let's pray, God. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you in all things. God, may we use the faculties that you've given us, the ability to take concepts and ideas and formulate them in ways that people can understand. May we use that for the glory of God and to build people up. God, we want you to use us. And that means our whole body. So help us make a difference. Show people who they are in you through the words that we say. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said.